All right, hello and welcome to the Growing Leaders Podcast. This podcast exists because the topic of growing the next generation, Christine, it's a hot one. Yeah, it is. Hot, hot, hot. And so it's hot with everybody. Let me tell you, it's hot certainly with marketplace leaders these days, people trying to find great employees and the future of their companies. It's hot with church leaders trying to find the future of their churches. It's hot for sure with young people. The one thing you can get young people to talk about is young people. But it's, it's hot everywhere. And so uh, excited for today's podcast. What are we talking about today? Well, today we're talking about five things. I'm not going to tell you what those five things are yet. Mm, because a mystery. We're going to mention them later with our great friend, Anna, who's going to be on with us today. Um, but there are really five things that, are, that we have seen um, in key to having a relationship with Jesus and growing in a life-giving relationship with him and a key part of developing the next generation leaders. Yeah. So this this brings up really the very, very core of this podcast. And if you, you're listening to it, it would be one of the key reasons I imagine you were here, which is uh, how, as a young person, if you're a young leader, do you develop? How do I grow? How do I develop? How do I become the kind of person that they write books about, make movies about? Or um, how do I live a life that, that's wonderful and beautiful and dynamic? But then the second piece is if you're somebody who cares about young people, which can be you know, as simple as a parent, on into an educator, on into any of the groups that we just mentioned, you care about like, what does it actually take? What is, what is required? What's important to helping develop young people? And specifically today, we're talking about spiritual development. We'll talk about a lot of things in this podcast, but at the core, it's always gonna come back to spiritual development. And so this is kind of like, the big the essence of this podcast isn't it really it is and it, yeah i would say it's the essence of this podcast it's stuff that is really core to boy the ball which is the organization that jamie and i both work for um but yeah i think it's i would say it's the essence of biblical faith but we'll get into that later yeah it's the essence of life if you can't develop a next generation things get <laughs> real short real quick and so the reason that it's so spicy isn't just actually that it's so important but it's spicy because we are really bad at it <laughs> and now jesus isn't jesus is really good at reaching people's hearts and developing them but if you if you look over the last uh 30 years maybe a little bit 50 years maybe 100 years, maybe 500 years, maybe 2,000 years. Um, this is a place where we get stuck as people who are trying to form faith in others. And so, I, you know, as before we get into today and we get a chance to talk to Anna, I wanted to bring up two points so we can kind of bat it around. But one thing that happens over and over again, is, and you see this, and you see it as a young person, it gets really, really boring. And you see it as an older person and it gets really, really rigid. But it's where we come at trying to form the next generation, first of all, with the sense of expectation. Oh, we need to get young people to live a biblical faith. You hear that kind of stuff. We really need to be concerned with the orthodoxy and they need to, we need to pass on sound doctrine to, you know, to leaders who can then pass it on to other leaders. And of course, absolutely important. That's true. You, we don't want to create a group of yo-yos or, or people who are bananas or heretics or all that kind of stuff. Yeah, you know, and I see you looking at me. But no, we don't, we don't want to do that. Of course. The, the second thing that we turn to, uh, and obviously the reason that that's unappealing to young people is nobody really loves you to come to them and say, we're not sure you're going to measure up. We're pretty sure you're going to blow it. Sit down and listen to us. So it's like the worst framing of a, of a relationship and a conversation when you start with expectation. But then the second thing that we get into doing, and this is where we really get in trouble, is after expectation, we focus on information. Content, 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 content. We need kids who will read the Bible. We need kids who will memorize the Bible. We need people who will make sure that their ethics and their morality is right. We need um, you to listen to my message. We need you to uh, spend an hour in a quiet time in the morning. We need you to know it's information, information, information. Of course, you know maybe if you're the person who's doing all the talking and you need an audience, that, then that's good for you. But it doesn't work for the people who have to sit there and just like passively receive it specifically around faith, because faith is an action verb. And so what gets missed in expectation alone or information alone, which both are key parts, is formation. And that's where somebody says to you, hey, this is important stuff. And hey, there is a biblical reality, all these tools that Jesus has laid out to help you. 
and Jesus is knowable, and there, there really is biblical truth, and it doesn't change. However, God made you really uniquely, very dynamically in this critical moment, and I can walk with you, and we can be with you to not only talk about what the expectation is, not only talk about even what the information is, but to talk about how to equip you to actually make it your own, to make it work for you, you know? Uh, a lot of people, you can get a free donation of Salesforce, this online tool a lot of companies, a lot of ministries use. But one of the things is it's such a big tool, nobody knows how to use it, and you have to pay a lot of money for this free tool to be used. It's kind of where it ends up being for young people. It's like, yeah, they can they get all this stuff laid on them, but how does it work for you is what they're dying for. And then the older generation turns over away, and they say, you know what, they just don't really care about what's important. And the truth is they just yearn for it to be made possible for them. So is that is that right? Is that your experience? Um, I think it's definitely right. I think it's also incredibly generational. Um, because I th- as I'm listening to you speak and I'm, you know, it's kind of sifting through, and I've heard some of this conversation before too, as we've talked back and forth, but um formation and equipping, you use both words, are really, really key in developing the next generation, but specifically this next generation um, because the way content is coming at them in every direction on their phones, on their computers, at school, on their tablets, on the radio, in these 30 second videos and reels and TikToks, like stuff's coming at them from every way um, and it's being consumed from every way. Um, So then just yelling things at them, like these are the things that you need. These are the things that you need. It's kind of blowing right past them and it's not helpful, but equipping and formation is taking these key Mm -hmm. biblical truths, these key things about Mm -hmm. living a life of faith, which to your point, faith is action. It's alive. It's not, um, it's not religious. It's not, um, this thing in the corner of the room. It's all, it's something that's alive in you. So you're teaching someone and you're walking with someone into discovering these things and what it means for them into a, to the point where then they're, they have a relationship with Jesus and it's alive and it's growing and they're being formed. Um, but a, a more traditional model from previous generations, not even that long ago, was very instructional. But there also wasn't the same level of content and distraction coming mm-hmm. from every other direction. Like the way you learned was by instruction. Yeah. You didn't have a podcast. I mean, you may have had a, a tape that yeah. was instruction, yeah. but you didn't have the same uh, level of video interaction and hands-on learning and um forms of instruction, even in, at schools where you have tablets and all this other stuff. And so mm-hmm. a young person's mind is being rapidly developed to consume yeah. content in so many different ways. But one thing that is remained the same across all generations is relationship. Yeah. And it, you learn the most if you're walking with someone, learning from them. That's one thing that transcends all X, Y, Z, alpha, every generation. Um, is is having someone walk with you, um, not just telling you what to do, but living a way that you should live and showing you what it could look like so that then you learn. Um, and I think that's a part that's often missed. Um, you know, it's easy to create a video now or to do a podcast like we're doing, um, but we do often miss the, just the relationship aspect where you're walking with someone, which is what you had mentioned earlier, and we'll talk about a little bit later to, um, l- later today on this, but... Um, yeah, formation, I think, is key. And how we're forming is key. It's not just instructional. It's not transactional. But it's it's in relationship. It's in in um, co-going together. Yeah, you nailed it. And I think that brings us to the second point, which is the reason young people many times aren't receiving biblical formation or into a biblical faith uh, and wrong, biblical information to try to draw them to the expectations of a biblical faith is it's not being done in a way that's biblical. Like what you just said, what you just described is a different way, you know, a way that's relational and stuff like that. That sounds a heck of a lot like a guy, Jesus, who 2000 years ago is what the whole thing's about. You know, it's funny, we get caught up in teaching young people to recite his words, but we don't lead them into the way Jesus engaged those 12 guys 2000 years ago, which was relational. Hey, they said, where do you, where do you stay at? Where do you live? And he said, well, come and see, you know, and he invites them into his life and he invites them into getting to watch the way he handles everything, every part of his life, how he responds to his mom, his brothers, everything, um, how he responds to finances, how he responds to religious leaders, how he responds to a blind person or adulterous woman. 
Uh, but then also he demonstrates the power of God in ways where, man, everybody would want to be there for that, you know, stuff like that. And then sure, yeah, he gets to proclamation. But I love your point too, because you think about, you know, um, Methodism started by these two amazing guys, John Wesley and George Whitfield. And they're in a time where you had no television. You know, if you could, to get into a church, you had to pay pew rents. So if you're poor, you can't even get to a church to hear that content. So these guys come up with an innovation, which is they step outside the door of the church and they start street preaching. So the only other place you could go to hear the kind of talent they had would be to go over and pay uh, to go to the Globe Theater to watch William Shakespeare, who, you know, at that moment it's kind of coming out, you know, uh, as it's being written and developed. Um, so you are having a level of entertainment and engagement for that kind of street preaching that probably was explosive. It was the coolest thing. It was better than TikTok they for sure. They never saw anything like They'd that. They never seen anything. And so, of course, that gets it. So now we're today, you know, 400 years later, <laughs> mad that people aren't gathering around us on the street corner. But you're right. Things have changed. I, I think that's an excellent point. Well, what, would el what else would you say as we get ready for Anna? Um, Anna is a good friend of ours. Um. You've known her for a very long time. You have too. I have. Ann and I lived together for seven years as yeah. roommates before I got married. Um, she's one of my best friends. And she's a big part of Boy the Ball. And I know that these five things we're about to talk about were a big part of her formation, which I think is key. I think use, framing the conversation around formation, I think, is really important because it's not, I think, something that's also from a, a former mindset is impartation. I must take these things and give them to you to the next generation, but we're missing that connection of how we're making the pass off. Um, and the way the next generation is receiving it, sometimes like, oh, I don't know what that means. Oh, it's like really overwhelming versus like the coaching, the training, the walking with. And in a moment right now where we're in unprecedented times and there's a massive level of disconnection that we haven't seen in a really long time um, in schools and in, in people's lives and what Young people yearn for the most is connection right now. It's great. Let's get to it. All right. We have with us today, Anna Michelle Curry, a good friend of me and Christine. We've known each other quite a while. We get to work together and uh, we have spent a good deal of our lives um, just hanging around the concept of these five things that young people desperately need in their lives, that if a young person gets them, they do great. If they don't get them, they don't do so well. But before we get into a lively discussion, Anna, uh, maybe we should intro you a little bit. So it's tempting to let Christine do it, but she was your roommate. And it, at one point, it just feels like that's <laughs> dangerous. So um, what do you do for a living? Uh, you know, where are you from a little bit? Yeah, like few minutes about who you are i work with you guys for a living nice. and with a lot of young people that sounds exciting it sounds like you're lucky spicy exciting looking spicy looking lucky <laughs> spicy all the things um i am from originally mobile alabama and though my family um is a mix of french arab and american so kind of a mixed bag. Uh, grew up in Alabama, uh, started at Auburn University out of high school, really where I encountered Jesus as my life was falling apart, and then moved to Texas, which is how I got involved with Boy at the Ball um, initially, and then was in Texas for a little bit, then in Costa Rica, then back to Texas before I came here to be with you guys. And what is your official title? Uh, chief operating officer. Oh, that's nice. So you do a lot of operations. Yeah. That's yeah. Cool. a lot of cheap whatever those do. are. A lot of surgeries. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, so here's the big question. So you were about 18 years old when you came around and started hearing about the five things, uh, mm -hmm. which what are the five things, Christine? Do you remember? I do. They are uh, hearing and obeying God's voice. Good one. Intimacy with the father. Yes. Living in life. Or embracing a life of faith and pain, mm -hmm. finding and filling God's purpose for your life, yes, and living life in the power of the Holy Spirit. Great. So yeah, so you Phew. come, you Coast. come around, and you start to touch those things. Mm -hmm. First of all, were those things that really the youth group you were part of, the church you went through, like were those mm -hmm. things that like you'd been heard, you'd heard about your whole life? 
Um, they weren't things I had heard about my whole life. I'm sure in different moments that pieces of them had, but not in a way that I could probably touch or come around. Um, partially just out of the disconnection in my own heart. And then partially, I don't think that they were being talked about that way. Um, and so the first time I really heard them was, uh, so I encountered Jesus in April of 2002. And then about two months later at a summer camp, met a lot of the boys, the ball team, um, for the first time, and then ended up at, uh, a second camp a couple, like a month later. And that was the first time I remember hearing about the five things. And it was the first time I saw a way that to know Jesus helpful things of like, what would that look like to walk it out? Cause I had had this encounter with him, um, a few months prior, but then what did that mean for my everyday life? And what did it mean to really know him and to, to, to live like that? Yeah. We were talking about this in the office the other day, but it was very, very popular in the eighties and nineties to talk about, you need to have a personal <clears throat> relationship with Jesus. Like it, it's not enough to go to church, not enough to have religion or whatever. You really need to have a personal relationship with Jesus. But you know, one of the things that young people run into, it's really tough to have a personal relationship with Jesus, but you don't know how to talk to him or hear him. Mm -hmm. Was that the case with you two or? Yeah. I mean, I think the, I see the five things as like a guide. Um, like it's, it's like a, like steps or tiers of just like what it takes to kind of, um, really know Jesus. Like, can I hear his voice? And then like, how do I do it? Then okay, I've heard his voice. Like, how do I like obey his voice? And then really intimacy with him and it kind of, it goes on. Um, but there are also things I, there are things that are assumed, which is part of why I say it as a guide, like in church, a lot of these things are things that you'd be assumed of a believer. Like you would just do these things, but they're not things that are actually like talked about, at least in my experience. And so then it's kind of like a handbook of just like, these are the things that takes to really have an intimate relationship with Jesus and to get to a point where you're finding and fulfilling your purpose and and then stepping into life in the spirit where it's just like miracles are happening, crazy things are happening. Yeah, I was uh, involved in the first group that that this list first emerged with. But one of the things that was happening and is still happening is an older generation starts to feel like young people just don't care about the things of God or they don't care about Jesus. And so they start to be like kind of angry at them. When what's really happening is young people really care and really want these things to be true to them, but the way they're being talked about or the way they're not being talked about makes young people feel like they're just failing at this. Like, I am no good at knowing God. Like, it doesn't work for me. I tried it. It didn't hit me. And and then, of course, you know, there is an enemy who makes you think really horrible thoughts about yourself. And you have these young people, it's actually not that they don't have a legitimate passion for the things of God. It's that they don't see the pathway or the road, or the bridge, or the tools to get there. Would you say that it was that way for you, Anna, or have you seen that with other young people? Both. Okay. I think for me, too, there was a sense that it, I, I could, I watched other people experience something that seemed impossible for me to experience, or far from, um, with no, I think, use the word bridge, with not a bridge of how that, that would happen. And so it was the first time it seemed like there was a way that I could walk into all of those things. And I definitely see that with um, a lot of young people, uh, especially things being talked about in a way where to Christine's point, you are assuming that people know those things or young people have some reference or context. We were talking about that earlier today too. There's, you can't assume that people know because uh, they don't yet. Yeah. And so in the beginning, there's a part of this that is like each element of the five things are not situations where you could just imply that you're going to get them automatically. So there are some people that can come into church and really they're just going to sit in a row of a church and then they're going to go home and that's all that they want. And so for, for that group, of course, none of this is that important. You know, they don't care. There's another group that are often parents or people who have come into a church or somewhere in their life, they've really had an experience with God. Something's happened. It could be an amazing church service or it could be um, that they were alone, but God kind of broke in on their life in the presence of God. And so now they're raising kids or they're, or they're functioning as a leader and trying to help somebody who hasn't had that experience to walk into it. And that's really where you start to have the struggle is somebody who's kind of had it, trying to help somebody else have it, but not necessarily giving you um, the, 
the, the, the, the stepping place. It's kind of like trying to get on a horse without stirrups is really what it's like. And mm-hmm. so for instance, so hearing God's voice, you know, there, you hear a lot of voices, you know, you hear the enemy's voice, you hear your own thought life, that ability to quiet those two down. And then how do you know if the voice that you do hear is, is him and stuff like that, mm-hmm. that process is almost like, it's almost athletic. You know, there's a, there's a lot of ways it can go right. A lot of ways it can go wrong. There's a lot of help and training and time and focus that, that you need. But if nobody's talking about it, how do you get it? You know, what do you guys think about that? Yeah, no, I would agree with that. I um, And I would actually, there's two things that I would challenge in something that, in, that you've said. Not that I disagree with what you've said, but there's two points that you've made. One, I don't believe the five things are just for young people. That's true. Um, and then two, I wonder how many of the people that you mentioned in the beginning that um, are, well, you said, it, you know, they're just happy with just like sitting in church and um, and just kind of that's, it's not for them. How many have just resigned themselves to just sitting in church because they never got a hold of the tools they needed to go further? Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think as, um, I mean, I am a new parent. Um, I have a two-year-old. And there's so much of in parenting where like I I know how to hear Jesus for me. How do I learn to hear Jesus for her? Um, and then um, as in walking with young people or in walking with my siblings or family or people around me, there's so much of – there is a part of in learning to decipher what he's saying and make small the enemy's voice or my voice and figuring out what's really his voice. There is a part of it that's a miracle. Um, and so how do you – how do you then learn to figure out what that is for you? Yeah. Um, how do you make the other things small and where then he's amplified? And there's different tricks, you know, um, in there's the living word of God. And then there's like being in a type of relationship. I'm just like, it's learning, finding the right frequency. Um, but it, that isn't something that's often talked about. That's right. There's a, oh. well, go ahead. Sorry, Hannah. And I was going to add just another piece to what Christine's saying that, and you watch it in my story a little bit where my parents are both people of great faith and have their own faith journeys and stories that are pretty dramatic. But I think you watch the attack of the enemy on my life from a very young age against a lot of these things that we're talking about. I think specifically hearing God disconnection from these things. And so there's, I think for people also who have experienced it, but then the turning to relay it and teach it, there's also a pretty massive attack, I think, on young people walking into these things. Yeah, if you combine what the two of you are saying, you know, our, one thing is, are you willing to wait for the miracle? Because like, mm-hmm. it, it is a miracle. Something has to happen. You don't just walk in and automatically, you know, you can walk into a church, you can pick up a Bible, you can read a Bible. doesn't mean that it's going to hit your heart and stuff like that. But you can't walk into a church and just say, speak to me and and automatically it happens for everybody. It does for some people and thank God for that. Um, so the question is, as you walk in, are you willing to wait? Are you willing to, mm-hmm. to wait it out for that breakthrough or that miracle to happen where some of these become very real to you? But then, um, but then on the other side of it, um, besides the fact that are you willing to wait for it, it's not like you're waiting in a vacuum. You're waiting with an attack happening. You're waiting with voices that are coming in. You're waiting with doubts about yourself. And for most people, you're either a young person where you have all sorts of extra doubts because you're growing into a new body, or you're an older person where it's now been years and your part of your heart doesn't believe it could happen, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I, w- I would say one other thing, though. We've talked a lot about the power of three tools that help those five things grow more easily. And you guys know these, but a coach, so somebody's a little further ahead than you. But second of all, um, a team, a group of people that are also equally committed to growing in these things that every once in a while are getting ahead of you or are falling behind, but you're kind of growing into them together as a, as a group. And then finally, a playing field. And that's the thing that has been a huge innovation. It's something that you'll hear across this Growing Leaders podcast over and over again is that it is easier to develop leaders when you lead them into action. And around these five things, that is completely the case. Um, Anna, for you, uh, what was it like to walk into all of a sudden hearing about the five things, but then being put into situations where you had the opportunity for a coach or you had the opportunity all of a sudden for a team and you had the opportunity for a playing field, 
to help you combat some of the negative voices and then being able to kind of get to the point where you were seeing breakthroughs? I, I think that made such a big difference because if, if I think about my life as I was starting to make changes, the five things starting to really um, walk into what does it mean to hear God's voice and to stay close to him and to face situations and not run that are difficult. And what is my purpose? Um, I was a little isolated initially, just, I was living in Alabama. Um, I was talking to a coach, uh, to actually you and Kathy, your wife. And, um, but probably without some of the team and playing field. And I, I remember we got to a point where between my parents and me and, and you guys, it became pretty clear that probably a change was needed in order for faith to grow. And we all recognized I'd have to go back at some point and, and face some things, but that I had grown to a point where I, I'd probably needed something deeper. And so moved out to San Antonio and um, was uh, around the boy at the ball team participating and then pretty quickly got drawn into uh, going and recognizing I knew in myself that I wasn't uh, I wasn't clean. I was messy. There were a lot of things that still needed to happen, but I was watching that as God changed my life. He was also um, the same things that were helping me were helpful to other people in the immediate. And so you, I watch where a team alongside those five things and alongside a coach made a big difference because then I was around people who were growing and fighting to grow in faith and helping me grow in faith. And there was something inspiring and convicting about hearing people's stories every week about the great faith that they had in their classrooms or in the grocery store or with their neighbors um, or in outreach situations, um, just in life. But then the ability to go with team into all these situations and then see God do miraculous things was life-changing. Yeah, that that leads to stories. You know, those things just lead to amazing stories and that makes it really, really fun to know Jesus. It makes it fun to be a part of a group of people and to yes. grow. Well, this podcast, as we talk about growing leaders, we're going to be talking over and over again about the importance of these five things and coach team playing field, some of these pieces, as well as other other points. But would we be able to have you back as a guest, Anna? Would you guys take me back as a guest? Oh, sure. Only if you pay us. Yeah. Okay. Whew. Now that's your Maybe roommate. in snacks. That's an old roommate talking. <laughs> Bring some tonight. All right. Thanks, Anna. Thank you, guys. Great today to get a chance to sit down with your old friend, Anna Curry, right? Yeah. yeah. I like Anna. She's spicy. She is. She adds a lot. That's nice. Um, so one of the things I was thinking as Anna was talking, as you were talking, we were kind of hitting around just uh, the power of the five things, uh, the power of coach and a team and a playing field. One of the things that's really, really interesting about it is that as we're talking about reaching the next generation, uh, as we're talking about raising up a next generation of leaders, we're sometimes just worried about, is it even going to are we even going to keep going? Are we even going to make it? Are you going to able have somebody to hand the baton to like that kind of thing? But when you're talking about these five things, not only is this really, really relevant to a next generation, it's the things they want to talk about. It's the things that every young person for thousands and thousands of years has ever wanted to talk about. Right. But there's another thing to look at is that when you're drawing young people in to learn to hear his voice, just as Abraham did, just as Moses did, just as Paul did, when you're drawing them into staying connected with with the Lord throughout the day where they're abiding in him and they're, they're not caught up in their thought life without ceasing, but they're caught up in him. When you're teaching them how to hold on to faith and keep going in what God's saying to them, even when there's suffering, even when there's pushback, when you're teaching them how to hear God speak to them about what he's called them to and their purpose, it is like a slingshot and a rubber band that launches them then into that fifth, which is life and the power of the Holy Spirit. So the great thing about these five things is, yes, it's a chance to intrigue in a next generation. But more importantly is it really accomplishes what every generation truly needs, which is an encounter with God where he moves in his power to transform a city or to transform a family or to transform a couple or a marriage. You know, um, when, they, when they get those first four things with the help and the support of a coach team playing field, it launches them into life and the power of the Holy Spirit. And man, 
that's what everybody has been after forever, right? Yeah. I think, too, it can, um, I think everything you're saying is very right. I think it's also important to recognize what each of those things mean. Like, um, because it can be like, oh, well, I'm busy. You know, I already have the people that I walk with or, you know, I'm already in my workplace and I don't need like another playing field. When really what we're saying is coach is really like who's discipling you, who's walking with you, who's someone that's slightly more mature than you and something that you can go back to and kind of bounce. This is what I think I'm hearing. And then team is really, it's the community of people that's what you're walking with. So it could be your small group. Um, it could be a group of college students meeting together in a campus ministry. It could be your youth group. Like who is the people that you're living life with? Um, and then in playing field is really like, where are you going to do it? Is it at your school? Is it in your neighborhood? Is it loving your neighbors? Is it in the marketplace? Um, it can be in the marketplace. Um, or it can be you with your coworkers doing something together. But it's not always adding something else. It's just being, int- it can be being intentional with where you are and where the Lord has set you. Um, I also think it's interesting. Um, if you look back at previous generations, um, I mean, there's, yes, there's like the charismatic renewal or these big moments where just like the Holy Spirit fall and just like crazy things happen. But oftentimes it's been like Jesus walking with the disciples where he just calls different people to join him into something. And then you learn along the way. Um, but there's often an assumption of just like, go figure it out. Um, and it's just from a teaching perspective, like I will t- tell you about God and you will do the things of God versus um, in discipleship or in a coaching environment where you're you're being told one-on-one or showed one-on-one and kind of wrestled with where it's like, this is what I think I believe. And it's like, that's crazy. This is actually what, this is what the Lord would say. Um, and so some of it's our setup is wrong too, especially now things move so quickly, you know, with technology, with content, it's so easy to consume great content, but it's not always, you're not always being wrestled with to get to a place of truth. What is that truth for you? Where are the places or the holes in your heart? You're right. And I think about like back in the 1500s, you know, when the Protestant Reformation is happening, Martin Luther encountered this and he came up with a shorter catechism and a longer catechism. How do you address these exact same things? And But those books won't work for today. And so you're kind of talking about a, a new approach or a new way to engage people that's really just very reflective of the way that Jesus did it, which is great. And, um, you know, two things that just end with today is that we are putting out a book on the five things that will have a a shorter ebook version. And then there'll be a printed version that people can get a hold of. It's like a good devotional book. It'll be great. So we'll keep you guys updated as that comes out. But, but to your point and to really conclude, you start to, when you start to live out those things, you start to realize things like where we all get excited about Acts 242, where they were meeting together daily and they're flowing in each other's lives. But to your point about these are just natural parts of your life that you have to build out. The reason you want to see each other several times a day is God's speaking to you, or you want to make sure that what you heard is biblical or, or you could confirm it. Like it's kind of funny that it's when you start to step into these things, all of a sudden, all of the Bible and all of life, all of a sudden they start to work. And it's very exciting. Well, it's the things we're made for. There's these holes in our hearts because these are the things that we long for and are made for, but they're not being engaged or satiated or filled by just content and teaching and, um, you know, things you blog posts and podcasts. You know, I realize I recognize I say that as we're you're listening to a podcast or watching this, but um, how do you put yourself in a situation where you're really growing and where you're really hearing him speak and then it's translating to parts of your life and your purpose and meaning being unlocked and like seeing his power move.